Today's true crime story is about a man who embarked on a deadly rampage throughout America's West in the 19th century. He killed so many people that it's hard to keep track. And unusually, often he wouldn't just kill his victims, he would eat them as well. My name's Carl, let's head back to the 1820s. Boone Helm was born in the year 1828 in the US state of Kentucky. Helm belonged to a hard-working and well-respected family and was just one of 12 children. The Helm family eventually moved to the state of Missouri, specifically to the township of Jackson in Monroe County. Growing up, Boone would quickly become known as a confident kid who would try and outdo others with exhibitions of strength and agility. He also seemed to have a liking for violence. He would try to entice men into fistfights. These sorts of stunts would bring attention from the authorities, whom he had very little respect for anyway. On one occasion, while riding on horseback, he pushed back against a sheriff's attempt to arrest him and rode his horse up the stairs of a courthouse and all the way into the courtroom in the middle of an active court session and aggressively berated the judge. By age 23, Boone took a liking to a 17-year-old girl by the name of Lucinda Browning, whom he ended up getting married to. The couple had a daughter who they named Lucy. Despite this, the new responsibility of being a dad didn't seem to mature him that much. Boone became known for rowdiness, heavy drinking, and also beating his wife. The extent of this violence pushed Lucinda to divorce him. Boone's dad was the one who ended up paying for all the legal costs. After having ruined his family's reputation in the area and bankrupting the family, Boone decided to move west for a new start. In the 1850s, the state of California was going through their famous gold rush. This boom would bring in about 300,000 people to the state from all over the world. Boone Helm wanted to join in on the action and move out there or, if not, move to Texas. Initially, Boone asked his cousin and neighbour called Littlebury if he would come along with him. By some accounts, Boone was drunk at the time and Littlebury simply obliged and said yes as a means to pacify him. Someone informed Boone of Littlebury's intentions. So one day, Boone arrived at Littlebury's doorstep and asked in a friendly tone, So Littlebury, You've backed down on the Texas question, have you? Littlebury attempted an explanation, but was cut off. Well, are you going or not? Say yes or no, Boone demanded. No, Littlebury firmly replied. Almost instantly, Boone pulled out a bowie knife and stabbed his cousin in the chest with it, killing him right away. Boone then set off for California alone. Meanwhile, Boone's other cousins and cousins' friends quickly found out and they were promptly on Boone's trail. The mob eventually caught up to him and captured him by surprise at an Indian reservation. Boone was brought in for trial at Monroe County Court and was found guilty of murder and eventually ended up in an asylum for the mentally ill. As a prisoner, Boone became very quiet but he would open up a little and manage to convince an asylum guard to take him on walks through the forest. Once these little outings became standard routine and he had gained the guard's trust, Helm found an opportunity to escape and took it. Undeterred by previous events, Boone headed once again for California. On the way, he became tangled in many incidents and allegedly murdered many different people. Now, very little is known about these killings, but there was one particular account which was revealing. It said, I saw on the trail a procession of men carrying three stretchers. I found on meeting them that they were carrying three dead men. They were found on the trail coming from Caribou, robbed and murdered, for each of them had been carrying bags of gold. Who was the murderer or who were the murderers? Everybody said in whispers that it was Boone Helm, a gambler and cutthroat. 
Boone eventually partnered up with a team of six men who in the past had eaten all or part of their murder victims. It is around this time when Boone began eating his victims as well. The men continued west, and as they were approaching eastern Oregon, the beginning of a devastating mountain winter season began to set in. The group were on horseback and carrying very little supplies, but they continued to push further and further into the mountains. When they eventually approached the Bannock River, they were attacked by native Indians and chased into a wilderness they were not familiar with. After a while, their horses began to approach exhaustion and they had run out of food, so they killed their horses and made snowshoes with their hides and set out towards Fort Hall. This would be no easy journey. It would become a journey of survival. Their lack of supplies combined with the tough weather conditions made this the fight of their lives. One by one, the group became smaller and smaller as they succumbed to their surroundings. The weak died where they fell. Eventually, the group of six was now down to only two, Boone Helm and a man called Burton. Boone and Burton slowly pushed their way on and made it within reach of their destination of Fort Hall. Tired and weary, they lodged in an abandoned cabin. Soon after, Boone departed the cabin and left Burton behind. He pushed on to the old stockade but couldn't find any food there so he returned to the cabin. While Boone was trying to gather wood for a campfire, he heard a gunshot from the cabin. When he came inside, he discovered that Burton had killed himself. Boone didn't let the opportunity go to waste. He begun to feed on the dead body of Burton. He ate one of his legs, then wrapped the other one in an old shirt. He then threw it over his shoulder and continued on his way. An interesting note, at an earlier time, Boone had declared to the six men when they were alive that he would eat them too if it became necessary. A very tired Boone Helm was eventually found at an Indian camp by a man called John W. Powell, a famous American explorer. John took care of Boone and gave him food and clothing. Eventually, he took Boone to the Salt Lake area. During this time, he discovered that Boone had on him a bag containing $1,400 in coins, which he had carried with him during his entire journey. Even so, Powell didn't ask for any payment or compensation from Boone. Despite Powell's generosity and kindness, Boone never even thanked him and left Powell as soon as he could. Boone would stay in Salt Lake for a little while longer, murdering a couple of people as favours. Because of his actions, he started attracting attention he didn't want, so he set off once again for California, his original plan. When he reached California, he befriended a local man who had taken him in, a rancher who understood his desperate situation. Once again, Boone had no care for this, and he would end up robbing the man and killing him. It seems that the original plan of joining the gold mining boom was off and perhaps figured that it might have been easier to just continue robbing and killing people for money. This would lead him back to Oregon. In this period, he would kill several men. Exactly how many isn't known, but there are some particulars that we do know about. In the year 1862, in the small mining settlement of Florence, Boone showed up and approached a man called Dutch Fred. Fred was a man who had a reputation as a great fighter. Dutch had never offended or had any previous dealings with Boone, but Boone went right up to him and shot him dead. It's alleged that Boone did this as a favour to someone else. This was a big deal for the town of Florence, so Boone had to leave. Once again, he had to journey out into the wilderness. He trekked out and made it all the way up north to British Columbia. Along the way, he found a companion and, like before with Burton, he ate the man. Though this time, he didn't wait for him to die. He murdered him first. Eventually, the British authorities got hold of Boone and sent him back to Oregon. He was tried for the murder of Dutch Fred. At this time, Boone managed to get some help from one of his brothers who was affectionately known as Old Tex. Old Tex apparently had some money and used it to pay off the witnesses. 
So, with no evidence and no witnesses, combined with the fact that the public's interest in the case had disappeared due to time and the prominence of more recent atrocities, Boone was now free and he set out for Texas. Boone wound up teaming with the notorious Henry Plummer and his gang and would allegedly kill many more men. The trail of bodies they left behind them would eventually catch up to them, particularly Boone. One day, a small group of vigilantes approached him on the street while he was in conversation. Boone noticed the men standing there and said, If I'd had a chance, or if I had guessed what you were all up to, you'd never have taken me. The men grabbed him and other members of Plummer's gang and took him before an unofficial court of vigilantes. He initially claimed that he didn't know why he was brought in, but eventually admitted to murders in California and Missouri. He tried to implicate one of his friends and gang affiliates, a man called Jack Gallagher. Boone Helm was sentenced to be executed by hanging. On the 4th of January, 1864, there were roughly 6,000 people assembled in Virginia City to see a group of executions of criminals which were rounded up by the citizens. Waiting for his turn, Boone said, I have looked at death and said, I am not afraid to die. He then asked for a glass of whiskey. There was a full view on display for the entire crowd as the murderers stood on boxes. Boone looked around at the others getting ready for death. He said to his friend Jack Gallagher, Stop making such a fuss. There's no use being afraid to die. The process in general didn't seem to faze him, but Boone did have a sore finger that was bothering him more than anything. This caused him to finally lash out. He shouted, If you're going to hang me, I want you to do it and get through with it. If not, I want you to tie up my finger for me. Give me that overcoat of yours, Jack. You won't need it now, replied Jack Gallagher. It was now Jack's turn to be hung. Boone said to his friend, Kick away, old fellow. When it was Boone's turn, he shouted, Every man for his principles. Hurrah for Jeff Davis. Let her rip. He sprang off the box and died there at the age of 35 and is now buried at Virginia City's Boot Hill Cemetery. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more videos just like this, please consider subscribing. I would really appreciate it. Catch you next time for another true crime story.